order. We can know what's for. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, first order of business is to uh, review minutes of September 5th and October 3rd. Barring any objection, we can combine those two together. I will approval of September 5th and uh, October 3rd. Any comments, corrections? If not, those in favor of approving the minutes of October 3rd and December, September 5th, uh, say, say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. As opposed, say no. Approve the minutes of the previous meetings. First rule on the agenda is 19P55, Human Services and Home and Lactation Consultation Services. Uh, please take a seat while you're doing that, and we will introduce ourselves. Senator Ginny Lyons, representing Chittenden County. Senator Mark McDonald, representing Orange County. Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman from the Town's Friends. That's the address website. Representative Belinda Meyer, Sussex Town. State Senator Joel Benning from Caledonia County. Uh, Senator Chris Bray, representing the Addison Senate District. Thank you. And, uh, would you like to give us a brief overview of the rule? So, uh, my name is Linda Narrow-Mackle. I'm a staff attorney with Medicaid Policy. I work... Can I ask that everyone speak loudly because whatever's going on up there is... Okay. Thank you. I will try to project and if you don't <laughs> do one of these, okay? <laughs> if not, my voice loud. goes down. My name is Linda Narrow Macklemore. I work with Ashley Berliner, who would normally be here today on HCAR rules, but she is not able to be here today. I am a staff attorney um, in Medicaid policy that Ashley oversees the Medicaid policy unit at AHS. Um, we have seven rules before you today. One of them is a new rule, and that's the first one, the in-home lactation consultant services. Um, I just thought that for um, efficiency that I would mention the public engagement process for all the rules because it was the same. Okay. Um, we worked with subject matter experts within the agency. Prior to filing the rules, we solicited comments from departments, the Mead, and Vermont Legal Aid Society and considered those in initially drafting the proposed rule. Um, of course, when through the rulemaking process, we had a um, uh, public hearing on September 3rd, there were um, no witnesses, and then we received comments on just two of the rules, the first one that we're discussing today, in-home lactation consultation services, and also the medically complex nursing services rules. So, so let me move them to in-home lactation consultation services. This is a new rule, it's an existing service, the rule is catching up with our practice. Um, it outlines uh, existing policy for in-home lactation consultation. I want to emphasize that this is in-home consultation. Services that are provided in a hospital or office setting are not under this rule and are billed through the facility and not subject to the requirements of this rule. The in-home lactation providers, the rule specifies um, have to be licensed in Vermont, generally it's an RN or a midwife, and have to hold an, some, an international board certified lactation consultant certificate. Um, so, so these are medically necessary services provided in the home uh, by someone with the IBCLC. Um, and I'm, open, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Can you clarify the difference between a CLC and an IBCLC? Um, so, so I asked the difference between uh, the two providers, a CLC and an IABCLC. I, I, um, I'm going to use my excuse up front that I'm pinch hitting. <laughs> so let's just get that on the table so I don't have to keep saying it so when I'm, when I'm stumbling. But um, I, I know an IBCLC has to be a licensed healthcare provider and the, um, the other certification does not. And that's why we chose to have, Medicaid law requires that we have a licensed provider, and that's why we chose to have this um, certificate um, 
because of that. And it's also, the way it was described to me, and this is, um, is that it's just the qualifications, it's just a much more robust qualification process. So the, the other certification can be used in an inpatient or office setting, but in the home it is, it's the RN or um, midwife who has gotten the certificate. So the one required for a home, in-home service, is, the, is an otherwise licensed medical provider. Yes. But the CLC can be a can be an otherwise licensed provider, or can be a, a lay person, for lack of a better term. That's my understanding. Um, and it, it was also a consideration of sort of the merits of each certificate, certificate, and that this was. Um, uh, I guess had a much more robust requirements. So that's what I, that's the explanation from our subject matter expert on it. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yes. Thank you. Are there other questions? I, I don't have a question. I, um, I did recognize this rule as meeting statutory requirements and I have the sheet to give to Sharpie. And I'll do that for each one of the rules we look at. Are there any questions, questions, comments? If not, entertain a motion. I'll move approval <laughs> of 19P55. Uh, if there are no, no further discussion, then uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. And we approved rule uh, 19P55. Next one is 1956, with audiology services. Yes. Uh, audiology services, this is an amendment to an existing rule. And it's uh, basically, it was required because we had a limit on the number of batteries people could get per month. Limit the, ru the rule limited a person to six batteries per month. And we did rulemaking to remove that limitation. Um, while we were in the rule, we also moved prior authorization requirements, um, or we changed the rule to move prior authorization requirements to the Medicaid fee schedule, which we're doing with a lot of rules. We'll see that as and it gives the state flexibility to be able to amend prior authorization requirements. So that's essentially that rule change. Um, so I, I believe this meets statutory requirements. Um, I'm curious about what prompted the change in the number of batteries. Was that required, or was that a, a, a problem that I think was the, discovered in house? I think the latter is my understanding. It's it's um, surprising because we recently touched this rule. I can't. I really can't give you the history of it, but it is better for beneficiaries, right? right. <laughs> Expanding services. Um, are there any further comments, questions? If not. And motion to approve 19P56. So moved. Thank you, Jim. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. This rate. Keep going. Might be cold, but it's <laughs> That's right. Uh, next rule 19P57 dental services for beneficiaries age 21 and older. Yes. So this, this, um, is also a rule amendment, and it was required by um, statute, Act 72, that increased the maximum dollar amount um, for dental service, services for this population from $510 to $1,000 per calendar year. Um, and this rule makes that revision. Um, let me see if there's anything else. I think that is, that's the scope of changes to this rule. I think there, actually, excuse me, there's something um, at 4202.5A, um, periodic prophylaxis. Um, there was some loosening to allow, allow whenever medically necessary and not to require prior authorization. That was also a change. This also meets statutory uh, requirements. Um, I had a, a question. This, this has a financial impact. Uh, yes. Uh, 
and uh, and I'm wondering is that will that require additional um, or is that Medicaid money, is it federal money, or will that require an additional it's, state? It allocation? does require additional state dollars. Um, so well, it's oh, oh please. It was in the we did this in the appropriations bill for 2020 okay. this year. So it's coming covered back. for this year. It's covered. Thank you. Would you, I can share a little more, but if that's sufficient, that's okay. It's um, assuming a January 1 start date on this. Um, the program cost to DEVA in state dollars is estimated between four and six hundred thousand dollars in year one of implementation. Annualized cost should be between eight hundred thousand to one million three hundred twenty thousand. Let's see, excuse me for scanning this. The, um, the impact is, is estimated in the Joint Fiscal Office Fiscal Note from March 2019 that was presented to the legislature. Um, and that is, it says that DIVA received an additional appropriation of $1,083,893, effective January 1. And is there any estimate of the savings from increased preventive care? Um, I think the economic, the economic the impact statement. <laughs> yeah, I think the answer is nothing solid. Like that we, right, preventive care should mean, yeah, it should mean saving acute dollars later, but we don't have an estimate. So this was a bill that originated in the Senate Health and Welfare and then did go to appropriations and Linda's representative. Um, My father. <laughs> uh, the, um, one of the things that we discussed was the advantage uh, to folks who have uh, their teeth fixed in getting jobs and so then helping them to move off public assistance. So we saw this as an opportunity. Well, in addition to which, um, in appropriations we discussed the fact that there didn't seem to be that many people overall taking advantage of the plan when it was the $500 because when you look about going to a dentist you understand that so part of the reason that we felt that we could increase it was that perhaps they would get more people involved in the program because again as Senator Lyons has said people who have their teeth fixed have a better opportunity for employment thank you yes uh, any further discussion questions on this rule? If not, entertain a motion. I'll approve. 19P57. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed, say nay. We have approved 19P57. 19P58, uh, uh, dental services, beneficiaries under age 21 and pregnant and postpartum women. This is also an amendment to an existing rule. It's a tweak, but an important one. I think since we were touching the other rule, we came in and, and touched this one. So dental services works differently for under 21s because there's a requirement under federal law that we provide all medically necessary services to under 21s. They, the EPSDT benefit. And so we revised this rule to make more clear at 4.203.5 that, um, that, that particular services that are named there are provided if medically necessary. It's just meant to make it more clear. And the prior, let's see, is that right? And there's not, and prior authorization isn't required. So it's meant to, to um, I think, Increase access and align with federal law. Um, based on the committee review, this will be statutory. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments on this rule? Senator Bennett. Actually, this might be for Senator Lyons. Can you tell me why there would be criteria necessary for pregnant and postpartum women? The part of the part of the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. It's um, so I don't. This may be quite. This isn't going to be in the weeds, but I can tell you that the um, 
the law requires that the services provided to under 21s, dental services, be that, that pregnant and postpartum women get the same services. So there's a carve out and they travel along with the under 21 who have broader dental coverage than over 21s. It's, it's the, I'm sure the feds meant to expand access to pregnant and postpartum women recognizing that dental care is important to um, babies. babies, I guess, yeah. It's not intuitive, I mean. <laughs> Yeah. I'm ignorant in this subject, so I don't, I'm asking no, blind ignorance, I just wanted to understand. It's a great question. Yeah. Any further questions on this rule? <clears throat> if not, I'll move <laughs> approval P, 19P58. Uh, all those in favor of approving 19P58, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. And we approve 19 Next one, 19P59, eyewear and vision care services. Yes. Uh, this is a um, also an amendment to an existing rule. It's very small change, and this would be an example of where we've moved. You see at 4.214.4, .4, prior authorization requirements from rule into Medicaid fee schedule, and again, that allows us greater flexibility um, when we have to change prior authorization requirements. We don't have to do rulemaking. There's also another change which is intended to ensure that this rule aligns with federal law for um, EPSDT coverage for children under 21 to make clear at C above that, at point three, that if we specify how many glasses, pair of glasses, under 21s can get per year, but the reality is that federal law requires us to provide whatever is medically necessary. So this, this language is intended to make that clear. Generally, it's this amount, but if there are other circumstances, then we do cover more. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> any questions, comments on this rule? If not, I a motion to approve P59. Why not? 19. I approve. <laughs> <laughs> Move that we approve 19 P59. All those in favor, uh, say aye. 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 And those opposed, say nay. And you approved 19 P59. 19 P60, uh, medically complex nursing services. Yes. So, um, Yes. This rule was previously called high tech nursing, I think, um, and that's what the program is called. This is an amendment to an existing rule. The intent is not is to make the rule align with actual practice, not to change services we're already providing. Um, we changed the title from high tech nursing. I may not have that full title right. To medically complex nursing. Um, it's not a change in services, it's just meant to be a more meaningful title because the reality was that to get these services you didn't have to be technology dependent. You had to have a medically complex need. So we thought that would be more transparent. Um, the rule as written now is um, allows these nursing services, these are to, well, these nursing services to be delivered through a home health agency. This rule would revise that requirement and permit these services be provided outside of a home agency. Um, so now an RN or LPN can directly enroll with Medicaid rather than working through a home health agency. And this is, um, um, and that's current practice. And why that evolved is because of the shortage of nurses and trying to expand access for these families. Um, also, on um, this one, I have a, a, a little um, fly in the ointment, <laughs> so, which is um, we would like to, upon um, after re-reviewing public comments, particularly from Vermont Legal Aid, um, we looked back at the rule and would like to add text to add clarity to make sure 
because as it's written now, there's concern that it looks like we're taking away services. Um, and so, and specifically, there's text that says we provide case management services. Um, we have, um, which, we, which we removed in the proposed rule, but we'd like to put back, and we just just met um, with VLA before, and I think, I, th I don't know if Barb's, I think Barb's gonna testify. So, in any case, we'd like to um, replace that language with language that we think more accurately reflects what we actually cover, which is it's nursing care, nursing care plan management oversight um, as appropriate and permitted within the scope of practice. This is not intended as any change in services. What section would that be? Oh, I'm sorry. It's four point, and I have a 4.232.2. We propose, may I have permission to pass these out? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Could you pass them to Senator Brown? Oh, okay. Would you pass those around, please? Um, This seems to solve one problem, but not the other. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, legal aid on that. Uh, you would still like to testify? Yes. yes. Before, uh, yes. before this witness steps yes. down, though, can we ask this witness why the second issue with legal aid is not addressed? This is in 4.232.5b. They were asking for a specific phrase to be put back in the past the benefit here which appears to have been struck from the document you just handed out. Do you know why your office chose not to include that change? Okay, 4.2325B? Yes. yes. Okay, that's a carry forward. Yep. So I'm reading from the annotated. It, the current rule as written does not permit, says unused service units, units may not be carried forward. And we are, so we're not changing the meaning of that text. We're payment for service, the text we propose is payments for services will not exceed the units authorized. The only difference in between that and the current text is we change cha shall to will. The second sentence now reads, I'm sorry, it's hard to read. I, unused service units will not be carried forward or used for other services. Um, and it had said, so hard to read the annotated and, and follow. It had said, unused units may not be carried forward. So the same meaning, it's not meant to be a changing meaning. Is there a problem? Sorry. I, I understand that. Okay, I'm sorry. But Legal Aid was asking for a phrase to be inserted. Okay, yes. The benefit uh, not be, any service units will not be carried forward past the benefit year. Did you look at that and make yes. a conscious decision not to include that? Yes, we did. And can you tell me why? Yes, because um, these services are under our Medicaid state plan, 
and the state plan does not give us authority to carry forward services. It requires that we do prior authorization, which in this program we do through an assessment tool, which basically functions as prior authorization. The assessment tool determines um, nursing services required within a weekly period. Um, and there's, there, um, so it's what somebody needs within a week. If someone has a change in need, they can ask for more services based on change in medical necessity. But there isn't a concept and there's no authority and we would not receive federal matching money for actually allowing a family to carry forward services. We understand that there, there and I can't speak in much specifics about this, that there are families who are on the developmental disability waiver who get these services and do some sort of carry forward um, but that flexibility is within a waiver, which is outside of our state plan. It's, it's the waiver, are, by definition, are services that aren't under our state plan. We have permission from the feds, so to speak, to um, allow certain things in, in the waiver that we can't allow under our state plan. So there may be anecdotes of families where, it, I mention that to the extent that anyone ever says that this family gets it. So our staff has told me that they're only getting that under a waiver authority that they get because they're under a waiver. Senator Glass. So as, as you read this, um, it does say, when you look at the one that you handed out, not exceed the units authorized. So when you say units, are you talking specifically about dollars? I think, I don't know if it's hours or minutes, Susan. Hours? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, hours. Yes, hours. So it is the payment on a fee for service basis, or are some of these folks moving to a per member per month? System? Fee for service, is that right? <laughs> so when it moves to a per member per month, per month, right? It's, it, ultimately, all of this will. So the concern I would have is if it does that, then safe, you know, carry forward has little or no meaning. Uh, Susan Coburn, Medicaid Policy, I work for the department. Um, just really quickly, this program is a fee for service program. Um, any changes in payment models or methodologies? I don't believe would apply to the allocation of hours to these individuals who are receiving direct nursing care uh, in the community. We can follow up with hearing, but uh, per member per month, this is a separate nursing services provided to individuals in their home. Okay, so um, that'll be interesting when we get there. Uh, the, the, it's fee for service, sorry. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand this so if somebody if there's an allocation of four hours a week picking a number randomly and two hours are utilized then the remaining two hours just kind of disappear there they can't be used right the medical necessity determination as I said is based on a medical need of that individual in their home for a weekly allotment <coughs> I'll, I'll wait and listen. To, I'd like to listen yeah. then legally. Yeah. To, you know, okay. Yeah. I can formulate my question. Uh, yes. Well, bad enough. Uh, Please tell me where I should. Do you want me to stay uh, here? Or no, if you sit? would uh, take a seat and yes. let legal aid come up to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rachel Seelig. I'm a staff attorney in the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid and previously spent about two years in our first and with the state's first medical legal partnership. Um, we are here to comment on the medically complex nursing services rule, um, which you've, you've heard about a little bit already together already. Um, and I want to start by kind of backing up to the big picture about what this program is. Uh, this serves a very small number of Vermonters, but Vermonters with incredibly high need. Um, some are allocated 
up to 112 hours of nursing care in their homes every single week. And the way that that happens is they get, a, they get assessed and then they get a letter. And that's generally a letter that tells them how many hours they're supposed to get per week for the next year. Unfortunately, most of these families are only getting on average about 50% of those hours filled. And that puts an incredible strain on the children, on their families, and on our whole medical system when they get sick because they're not getting enough nursing care. We've been meeting with the state for almost a year trying to work on this issue and there has been some forward progress on a couple pieces that will help about three of the pediatric families um, across the state. We um, were very much hoping that the rule change would also be a step forward in um, solving some of the problems that have prevented families from getting all the hours that they are allocated. And we're very glad and agree with the change in the case management language um, that, that Linda mentioned earlier. Um, but we do think it's very important to really look at this, this carry forward issue carefully because right now families, as you said, don't get all the hours and then those hours go away. And so unless they then go back through the assessment process to get allocated more hours per week, they can't then use those when the need increases, either because the child has gotten sick or because they've been in the hospital and come, are coming home or because a caregiver has gotten sick or has left. And so now they need to kind of fill in um, uh, because somebody who's been unpaid is no longer available. So there are a lot of reasons why we think this would help the program function better for families. Um, and so that, that failure to change and create that flexibility, we think, will continue to keep this program that has been broken for a long time broken. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about our comments. If I could just add one thing. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, sir. I'm Barbara Prine. I'm also a staff attorney at the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. I think part of, like, you think of a very complex kid who usually has been in the hospital. And now, because we have better capacity, these kids are getting served at home. And um, so they're getting intubated, they're getting tube feedings, they're getting suctioning, they're getting airway management, they're doing things that are nursing level of care all day long. And when the nurses aren't there, the parents are doing it, right? And when there isn't enough nursing services, the parents miss work and they miss sleep. And if they don't have a nurse one week and they miss work and they miss sleep, and the next week there could be a nurse there, they can't use the extra hours. They can't make up the work. They can't make up the sleep. <clears throat> and we heard what the state said about why we, they can't do it. And I'm not saying that I think they're not telling the truth, but there isn't any reason why the allocation couldn't be an annual allocation rather than a weekly allocation or a quarterly allocation or a monthly allocation so that the families could have flexibility. I mean, this is a very broken system and this change could make it better. It, we think it'll only make it this much better, but for those families, this much better is better. I don't know who, whether this is for you or for the administration, but um, what kind of authorization or administration goes on to determine the use of hours? And so if you've got a, a kid in this situation where the hours are not used, and then they're looking to use them in the following week. What kind of process do the parents have to go through? So currently there aren't actually enough nurses working in the program for that to be a realistic option, unfortunately. Um, parents are allowed to ask for a reassessment at any time. Uh, these are parents who are incredibly overwhelmed with all the doctor's visits, all the hospital visits. And so to be able to take the time to call the children with special health needs social worker and find somebody to come in and do that reassessment is just realistically not feasible for these families. Is there a, um, a drawback to banking these hours in terms of, um, I mean, my understanding is the services are 
narrowly, the provided services are narrowly defined. Is there a Mission Creek concern? Is there, what, what is the rationale for not banking the option? And maybe this isn't a question for you. I don't understand it. I'm not sure there's a rationale for not banking the hours, um, but the state might feel I will ask the same yeah. question. <laughs> They've approved people for, for this many hours, and they, the state has the money for this many hours, right? They've approved it. They've said these are medically necessary. As um, Linda McLemore said, the state is federally required to provide all medically necessary care for children. And this is this kind of care is medically necessary care. Like this is, these are, like you meet the families and they're very sick children. So, um, extrapolating from that, is the not being able to thank the hours means that medically necessary services are not being provided? Yes. Because you said earlier that, that some patients are receiving half of the allocated services. Yeah. Correct. So some patients are, on average, it's about half. Some are receiving more, some are receiving none. Um, and they can't bank those hours for when they do finally get a nurse assigned to their family. And they are not, therefore, receiving medically necessary care. And the parents are stepping in to provide the care. Part of the problem is nurses are getting paid like uh, 15 to 30% less than nurses are at the hospital. So the hospital has a 9% vacancy rate. This program has a 50% vacancy rate. So we have a nursing shortage. We have a nursing shortage. We have a nursing shortage of 9% at the hospital. We have a nursing shortage of 50% in pediatric home care. Senator Clancy, you have a question? Right, so uh, one of the phrases that's there in B um, on the conditions for coverage is or other for other services, is that problematic? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that they're that they don't want to go outside. That you, the administration, doesn't want to go outside. Mm -hmm. Sort of what the, is medically necessary. So that covers. Does that phrase cover that concern? Would you just refer me to what you are now? I'm referring to uh, four point two three two point five B, and then it says. Payment for services oh, will not sorry. exceed the units. You're in another part of the world. Yeah, will not exceed part. the units and or other use for other services. Yes. Okay. So now, when you say will not exceed the units, does that imply that those units are available for the whole year? No, they're they're not available for the whole year. They're available, medical necessity is determined on a weekly basis. And that, and that determination is made on a weekly basis for these kids? No, there's approval for, so, um, and I may need Susan's assistant on this, there's a assessment tool that is designed to determine medical necessity on a weekly basis. Um, and then, can you tell me how, can you explain to me how services are yeah, so, so what again, kind of time? Right. Susan Coburn, Medicaid Policy, they are under the direction of a physician. A physician would submit an order for services. The prior authorization is through an assessment tool that's conducted by state staff talking with the provider, the family, and others. They determine the medically necessary amount of services allotted per week for that individual. If there are any changes in the medical need of the beneficiary, the state can reassess or provide additional hours as needed. We would be concerned about holding back hours one week for another week. I mean, that we want we authorize them as medically needed. I, can see, I see the conflict. I absolutely see the conflict here. I mean, the, the, having a single parent uh, having to perform the nursing duties and not and missing the job, miss, missing their work. Um, this is a. I don't know how we solve this problem. It, it, it's not <clears throat> simple, but I think erring on the side of the care of the kid, take care of the kids, uh, to me is really important within the rules. So the, the conditions that these services are provided for, are these generally 
chronic stable situations or do they fluctuate week to week? They're generally chronic. I'm not sure I would call them stable. I mean, these kids are very medically fragile and so when their nursing is provided, that's what helps them stay as stable as they can be. Um, but these are kids who need, often they need a ventilator for breathing or a trach um, for airway. Um, they need a lot of suctioning. Um, they can't eat food themselves, so they have to have it um, pumped in through a, a, um, a line in their stomach. Uh, and so those things don't go away. Those things tend to be things that, that the kids will need uh, as long as they can stay alive. Um, but, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, there are, I think, are other services that get prior approved for more than a week at a time. And so I, I'm not quite sure why. I mean, I, I know that families don't perceive as being prior approved for a week at a time because they get a letter and it's the letter they get for the year. Um, and I'm not quite sure why they couldn't be prior approved for a month or two months at a time. And, you know, for a family that's, you know, if even a school vacation, they might need more hours the school vacation week than they do the school week where there's nursing provided when the kid goes to school for two hours a day. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why being able to use hours flexibly, flexibly is, is good for, for these kids. Senator Bennett, did you have a I'm just mulling in my own head. I'm smelling that how far does this committee have the right to delve into what should be a committee of jurisdiction discussion, and I'm. Maybe we can ask them. Send us a letter. letter. I don't know why you wrote the letter. <laughs> <laughs> Send us a letter. Yeah. Okay. I was asking the same question about policy versus legislative intent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, so I've been in front of this committee before for years and years and years and years. Sometimes when there's this kind of conflict in legal say it says, I don't know why they can't do it this way. And they say, well, we don't think we could do it this way. I think one, I don't know if they're at their deadline, but a letter explaining why they believe they cannot authorize it for more than a week and having us come back to discuss it might, um, because maybe they can authorize it for one month or two months. and. And then, then you're not forced into the, you guys don't like saying, I understand, you don't like saying this doesn't meet the intent. There's a, there's a, you know, you care about our state government, and so there's a tendency to not want to do that. But I think we could um, put the state to its proof about why it can't do it, because I think they can. But I don't know as much as they do. They know more about this program, actually, you know, obviously, than legal aid does. Representative Myers. I would like to suggest their, their uh, um, period doesn't end until 1124, and we have another meeting. We're going to be meeting on 1114. And I would like to suggest the possibility of a legal aid meeting with the department to, to thresh this out a little bit better so maybe it's a little more understandable to us, and, uh, and, and hopefully they can come up with some agreements that uh, will make legally happy but also solve the problem that the department is looking at. So that's, I would like to move that we uh, ask legal aid to meet with the department uh, and come back to us on the meeting of November the 14th. Any comments or questions? That perhaps between now and then the they will tell us why they can't meet this right. meet the uh, position. Right. It's being suggested. Thank you. And just to clarify, so the does Legal Aid have a recommendation on uh, a time a carry forward time period? The service year, a monthly, quarterly review? I mean we had drafted a proposal for the service year, um, but I think we can talk with the state about that further. Uh, there is a motion on the table to postpone action until 11:14, for the next scheduled meeting. Any debate on that question? 
Now, if those in favor, postpone it until November 14th. Say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back. Yes. Please join us again. So that the final human services rule Medicaid cost sharing nineteen P sixty one. This is an amendment to an existing rule. Um, the rule is amended to exempt preventive dental services from co-payments as required by Act 72. And that's a 6.100.3 C2, you've added that text. Um, so I had a question that is uh, are our preventive dental services defined in this rule? You know they're defined elsewhere. Oh, um, so let's see. So I have a, a note and then I'll follow up on this occasion to clarify where it came from. Preventive services, and this, this is for over 21s and not pregnant postpartum women. Preventive services include two cleaning cleanings per year, periodic oral evaluation, application of chloride varnish, and tobacco cessation counseling. I cannot tell you where that, Susan, can you tell us where yes. that text um, comes from? Yes, uh, there was some language in the statute about what um, services were to be included. Um, this, the department did also review and add a couple things like tobacco cessation counseling, but it was following in alignment with the statute and the additional appropriations that were considered. So, so when it says uh, the following services are exempt, sexual assault related services, preventive dental services, and services otherwise exempted, where are those found? Yeah, so later it's in the rule and it's on the fee schedule and the dental supplement manual. It says these services are outside of the annual adult cap. And I think the notion is that it allows some flexibility, for example, preventively to expand. Without a rule change. Yes. Each statutory. Any further questions, comments? If not, entertain a motion. A little approval of 19 P61. All those in favor of approving 19 P61, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. And you've approved rule P19, P61. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next rule is 19P43, uh, Agency of Natural Resources, Mark Wetlands rule. Please join us. I, uh, so I just want to both colleagues know on the committee that I, as chair of a committee of jurisdiction, have signed off on both rules D43 um, and D44. So both rules yes. need legislative intent. But I brought it with me so people don't have copies. Thank you. All right. Good morning. In introduce yourselves and uh, Yes. I am Laura LaPierre, I'm the Wetlands Program Manager at the Agency of Natural Resources. And I'm Hannah Smith, um, Associate General Counsel with DC, working with the program. Um, the proposed change to the wetland rules is a very minor language change. The language itself appears in Appendix A. It's the addition of the Beaver Meadows Wetland Complex to the list of designated Class 1 wetlands. Uh, the Class 1 designation indicates that the wetland merits the highest level of protection based on an evaluation of its functions and values. 
This particular wetland um, is 66 acres in size. It's contained entirely within the Green Mountain National Forest, and the um, rule change is actually in response to a petition filed by the Ripton Conservation Commission, who provided a petition laying out the, the reasons for the proposed designation, which the agency then accepted the petition and moved forward with rulemaking. And I'll let Laura talk a little bit more about what the, the functionality of this wetland. So this wetland, which sits up in the Green Mountain National Forest, is 66 acres in size, so not the largest class one wetland proposal that's come forward, but also not the smallest. Uh, it, it has multiple different wetland community types, and it's unique in that it's within two different watersheds. One portion of the wetland flows into the Middle Boot River and the other side into uh, the New Haven River. It has um, all 10 of the functions and values which we evaluate. It's significant for all 10 of those functions, including things like flood storage, water quality protection, wildlife habitat, fish habitat, etc. It was found by the program that it reaches the level of irreplaceable for Vermont's natural heritage um, in two of the functions. The, it has uh, significant natural communities that are uncommon. In particular, there's dwarf shrub bog portions, which there are very few of those in the state, and also includes uh, black spruce bog habitat type as well. It's also irreplaceable, found irreplaceable for education and research in natural sciences. Uh, there's been a lot of studies done within this wetland in particular. There's been a lot of uh, winter tracking of mammal tracks and so there's a wealth of information on what animals use this wetland type as well as um, some of the earlier amphibian and reptile surveys done in the state were, were up in this area as well. Um, because the wetland has been managed by the Green Mountain National Forest, it's quite undisturbed and within an intact landscape. Uh, so that's unique for, for wetlands to have that um, pristine of the state. We have a, a way of evaluating wetlands with a rapid assessment method, and it's received the highest score that any wetland has received. So we felt that this was an irreplaceable wetland uh, that deserves class one protection. And we also determined that it deserves a 400 foot buffer zone in order for those functions and values to be adequately protected. What does the buffer zone, what, so, uh, what does that prohibit, or what does the buffer zone do? So the buffer zone is, you know, the area directly adjacent out to 400 feet from the wetland boundary, and it's the area where you could foreseeably do activities in that could harm the irreplaceable function of the wetland, and so if somebody wishes to do activities within the, that 400 foot buffer zone, they would need to apply for a wetlands permit with the program. Would that mean logging primarily or other? What are there, there, there are some uh, exemptions for logging, but certainly if um, a third party wanted to put in a, um, a ski slope or trails and such, they would need to have a permit in order to do that work. Well, given that this is in the uh, Green Mountain Forest, federal, federally protected? It's currently um, under the Green Mountain National Forest Management Plan. It's part of a special protection area. Um, so it is actually, the, there are federal protections in place as well mm -hmm. at the time, at the moment. So how, how, how does that sugar off when you've got both federal and state? Um, I guess my question is, would this happen uh, if we left it to the feds, would they protect it as class one? Or if we just put this in place, will this ensure 
broader protection. So currently, the class one protection is consistent with the way they manage the special area. I mean, there's no logging that's happening there. If they were to revise their management plan though, um, the class one protection would provide state restrictions if they were to lease the, if they were to revise the management plan and lease the area to a third party who intended to conduct some other activity that's currently prohibited under their protection. I have another question when everybody's finished with it. Does the Lone Crow go through this area? It's nearby, but not directly through the, the area. Senator Bray. Um, I have a, just a couple of questions. Um, so one, uh, glad to see this happening. Um, and some of these, I'm just, when I was using closely, I saw some things that made me wonder about the timing. So if I look on the application, the entire packet we have, um, section 20, page 5, says uh, hearing information. And it's dated 7-16-2002. Is that just a typo, or did, was there a conversation that was suspended from a long period before? No, it shouldn't, it shouldn't say 2002 on there. Um, Are these in the filing forms? Uh, yes. Yeah. Filing form page five. So I The discussion, just, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a typo. That was 2019. Okay, great. <laughs> I just was hoping that it, the program didn't take that long to move. <laughs> no, yeah. that hearing happened this summer. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the secretary has the ability to make the motion on him or herself to uh, move a class two wetland to class one. You don't need to wait for a petition, is that correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. Are there any such um, considerations underway now that you are aware of? Uh, well, we, we do have a, a list of wetlands which we've evaluated and um, could merit more review in order to potentially determine through the agency class one potential. Are they, I mean, is the agency moving these themselves or are they all in response to a petition from an outside party? Well, we have in the past, we don't have any in the works currently. Okay. Um, and then this is another, I, this is a want to understand better question, not a nitpicking question, but uh, on page two of this in our packet, so there is a response summary for revisions to the rule, uh, just a two pager. And on the second, uh, on response seven, page two of that section, um, there's a uh, there are some allowed uses that are allowed in class two weapons, but not in class one, including then the colon, and then there's no list. So can, I'm just, uh, in a way, following a little bit on the same, maybe, let's say, third center lines. What's allowed if it's designated class one versus class two? And within that 400 foot buffer, um, interested in whether or not agriculture could become an allowed use. Yes, so the allowed uses apply to all wetlands. Um, there are some specifics um, for forestry within class one wetlands uh, where you would need a forestry plan approved by FPR, Forest Parks and Recreation. Uh, so that's the, the difference with our allowed uses. Uh, the, the biggest change is really the activities occurring within the wetland itself, where you would need to uh, build a case that there's a compelling need for public health or safety in order to receive a permit from the agency to perform an activity within the class one wetland. That compelling need for public health and safety is not a requirement within the buffer zone but by having a broader buffer zone, which the agency has oversight over, uh, we're able to 
ensure that those irreplaceable functions and values won't be harmed by those activities taking place further out from the wetland. So right before that including colon, it does say up in terms of potentially allowed uses, repair and maintenance of existing structures, roadways, utility lines, low impact recreation, including snowmobiling and bass trails, and maintaining lawns, and civil cultural activities. Are all those, so this is, I'm trying to make sure I understand, is that a comprehensive list of what is allowed, and is that only for class two or class one potentially as well? That's not a comprehensive list. Um, those are examples, and um, our list is within section six, six of the rule, and all of those apply to class one and class two wetlands. So going all the way back to agriculture, we mm -hmm. 400 feet of uh, this wetland, a class one wetland, could someone uh, be in agricultural operations? If they are, um, if, the, if the area is all forested, like in this condition, they would need to apply for a conversion mm -hmm. permit, so that wouldn't qualify under the allowed use for agriculture. The, the agricultural allowed use works in conditions where it's a, the area had already previously been cleared and the allowed use is to plow and plant and harvest within those areas. Right. So for instance, the other, there's another application to take uh, wetlands in uh, Otter Creek and mm -hmm. change them from two to one. And the, those are adjacent to farmland. Um, so if they're already being farmed, mm -hmm. the move from two to one won't require those operations to agricultural operations to cease. I'm just trying to make sure I understand Correct. this rule. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have one last question. I know that you, um, you've you been before us uh, previously on class one, and there is the one outstanding class one concern I think that some of us on this committee have had was around the black gum swamp in Vernon and what has transpired with that. I know you worked very hard on a number of uh, classifications and that was one of them. But um, that's, I don't know what we can do about it. We can't do anything about it in this context, but I'm just, uh, the question that Senator Bray asked was there, were there other class ones that you're looking at or places you're looking at to to uh, classify and that is is that does that continue to be on the list or is it being forested uh, harvested for um, trees what's what's going on with that one do you know it had been recently harvested before we um, put forth the proposal and so it's not in a condition where anyone would be logging currently. Uh, I haven't heard anything about the area being logged recently. Uh, we did receive a letter from the select board uh, in opposition to the petition, and so we withdrew that portion of the proposal when we came forward with those, those four wetlands uh, a few years ago. and. It's, we've still determined it to be significant and irreplaceable in, in function and value. However, uh, we'd like to work further with the town to understand their objections and um, work with them rather than um, go forward with it. But I guess given proximity to the old power plant that's there, um, doesn't that meet the public health and safety criteria that you were talking about? I, I just wonder if this is a letter that we, or maybe we don't have to send a letter, Chris is sitting here. But I really think it's a, for me, that, that is a, that's a very unique um, wetland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it w I think it would be helpful to have committees of jurisdiction just evaluate where it is right now. 
I know the planning commissions down there were very interested in having a declared class one, I, but obviously a select board is a different kettle of fish. Anyway. Uh, yeah, as Laura mentioned, it's not because it met the, the qualifications. Um, it has not been removed from our list, but the agency has not um, brought it back in a rulemaking proposal based okay. on the opposition from the town. So, yeah, we still qualifies as a class one. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, we have another witness. Is Mark Nelson here? One, one, one moment, please. Are there any other questions for these witnesses? Thank you very much. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little late. I thought this was scheduled for later. Your timing was perfect. Okay, great. Um, thank you for allowing me to come and provide some testimony and witness. Do I need to state? Uh, just identify yourself for the Ripton. Mark Nelson, and I'm here as chair for the Ripton Conservation Commission. And um, I recognize that the primary job of this body is to look at the processes that are followed to make sure you follow the correct processes before a rule is implemented. But I'd like to speak today about why we'd like to see the uh, Beaver Meadows complex reclassified as a class one wetland. I'm sure you may have heard some of this before. I'm sorry I wasn't here the other testimony, so if there's some repeat there, I apologize. Um, so first of all, thank you, and I'm going to read from my written testimony that I did uh, that I did provide. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of the petition to classify the Beaver Meadows wetland complex as a class one wetland with a 400 foot buffer. The Ripton Conservation Commission filed this petition on September 14th in 2017. Um, and this was filed with the support of the Ripton um, Select Board, and also we did review this with the Ripton, with the Bristol Conservation Commission also. Um, protection of Vermont wetlands and headwaters is critical to address the water quality problem that exists in our state, as well as providing protection against the changing weather patterns that are resulting in more frequent strong storms. The Vermont Wetland Rules state it is the policy of the state of Vermont to identify and protect significant wetlands and the values and functions which they serve in such a manner that the goal of no net loss of such wetlands and their functions is achieved. The state of Vermont ranks the significance of wetlands based on 10 functions and values they provide for the general public and the environment. According to these criteria, the Beaver Meadows Wetland Complex is highly significant. It does meet all 10 f functions and values. The Beaver Meadows Wetland Complex is unique and is irreplaceable and should be afforded the highest level of protection by the state of Vermont as a class one wetland. The 66 acre Beaver Meadow Wetland Complex is located within the towns of Ripton and Bristol, which is primarily where it is. There's a small part that does go into Middlebury, but it's a very small section. And it's wholly within the Green Mountain National Forest. It's owned and managed by the U.S. Forest Service, and the Beaver Meadows Complex has previously been identified as an ecological special area by the U.S. Forest Service. It's a high elevation wetland complex that drains into both the New Haven and Middlebury Rivers. The Middlebury River in particular has high flood risk and is protected in part by this wetland. Abundant beaver activity has provided natural damming to hold back water from storms and snowmelt. The deep uh, peaty muck and surrounding wetlands allow for the absorption and slow release of water, which reduces flooding potential downstream and helps to offset or delay drought conditions. Because of the unique nature and, uh, and headwaters position of this wetland, contributing to the protection of two watersheds, the wetland is considered irreplaceable for this function. The Beaver Meadow Wetland Complex overall is significant for all 10 functions and values as identified under Vermont wetland rules and is considered exemplary or replaceable for three of them. Exemplary natural community, irreplaceable for flood and water storage, and education and research opportunities. And there's been a lot of data collected in this area for, for decades. Uh, when this process was started, uh, the more the research was done, the more data was uncovered over time. Um, much of it, um, old handwritten notes that had to be scanned and put in for being able to put into record. The wetlands program completed the Vermont rapid assessment method used to evaluate overall wetland quality and condition during a 2016 site visit. The Beaver Meadows complex scored 100 out of 100 point total, indicating it was in reference condition, meaning an unspoiled condition. 
Under the Vermont wetland rules, a class one wetland is provided a 100 foot buffer. Research conducted for the Beaver Meadows wetland complex has recommended a buffer of anywhere from 400 to 900 feet. And the reasons are one, to maintain uh, a 75% canopy to maximize the protection of the ecological integrity of the peatland complex and the wildlife habitat it provides, uh, to minimize the adverse effects on the quality of what surface water entering the wetland, and to provide suitable uh, protected habitat for foraging and overwintering by reptiles and amphibians. Based on these prior research and the prior findings and the prior recommendations, we're requesting a 400 foot buffer uh, for this wetland complex. In summary, the Beaver Meadows wetland complex provides immense, immense ecological value as habitat for wildlife and plants, including a number of rare, threatened, and endangered species. The wetland complex also provides important watershed functions, including flood water storage and surface and groundwater protection. The valley drains in three directions into the Middlebury River and New Haven River watersheds. The function and values it provides would be difficult, if not impossible, to restore due to, to complexity it encompasses. Therefore, the Ripton Conservation Commission respectfully requests that the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules approve this rule to classify the Beaver Meadows Wetland Complex as a Class I wetland with the 400 foot buffer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? For this Senator Brett. Um, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, uh, you're mentioning the 400 foot buffer. Is there discretion in terms of what a buffer, or how large a buffer is defined for any class one wetland? Uh, wetlands, um, uh, class one wetland typically has a, a minimum of a 100 foot buffer. We're requesting more than that minimum 100 foot buffer. Okay. Thank you. Um, following on Senator Gray's question, you mentioned up to a 900 foot buffer? That was the, the previous research had stated, depending on who had submitted the research and what they had done, anywhere from a 400 to a 900 foot buffer. And we're sticking with requesting the 400 foot buffer. And uh, did the town of Middlebury have any comment? Did they because it was a very small section that goes into Middlebury, and Middlebury did not have a conservation commission at the time we submitted this, we did not mm -hmm. talk to them. Uh, but I don't know if you've seen the map of this wetland complex. It, there's only a small section that goes into the area. We did meet with the Forest Service prior to this, and they gave us the answer that we expected, and that is they neither support nor will go against it, which, you know, if they didn't like it, they would say they didn't want it. But. Senator Bray. Um, I'd like to move uh, approval of Rule 19243. Any other questions for debate? If not, uh, all those in favor of approving the rule, please say aye. 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 As opposed, say nay. And you have approved Rule 19P43. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, 19P44. Uh, Agency of Natural Resources, reducing solid waste and increasing recycling and compost. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Um, for the record, my name is Josh Kelly. I'm the Materials Management Section Chief with the uh, Agency of Natural Resources Department of Environmental Conservation in the Solid Waste Program. And I'm Ann Bajoran, Environmental Analyst in the Solid Waste Program with Josh. <laughs> um, so this is, um, I guess first, why don't I start with um, that this is a plan, not a rule, but it is required to go through the rulemaking. Um, <clears throat> statute requires that, the, um, that Vermont adopt a solid waste plan every five years and it, it generally prioritizes um, the greatest feasible reduction in the amount of waste generated and to reduce the state's reliance on um, waste disposal uh, to the greatest extent feasible. <clears throat> this is, a, we're calling this plan the 2019 uh, Materials Management Plan um, and it replaces the 2014 uh, Materials Management Plan. Um, it seeks to, the 2019 Materials Management Plan seeks to reduce uh, Vermont's waste, <coughs> increased recycling and composting, and also uh, strives for safe management of household hazardous waste. 
um, sort of one of, the, one of the most toxic parts of, of a typical Vermonter's waste stream. The plan establishes uh, priorities and actions for ANR, the Agency of Natural Resources, as well as for municipalities to, to meet the goals, and it ensures consistent services um, for all Vermonters and consistent information statewide. Um, it, again, it's a plan, not a rule. It's covered under Title 10 BSA Section 6604. Um, and it has components including a, an introduction, uh, covering statutory authority, um, an overview of Vermont's waste, and then has plan priorities that are almost directly verbatim of what statute uh, requires us to do. Um, it covers markety, market and facilities assessment of various material types like recyclables, um, construction and demolition waste, um, as required by statute, covers the, both the market and facilities that are available for management <coughs> of those materials. Um, and, it, and its primary uh, core of the document is the actions that it requires of both the agency and our municipalities, our solid waste management entities that include solid waste districts, alliances of towns, and independent towns. Um, it sets up performance standards for, for both ANR and solid waste management entities. Um, ANR uh, conducted a, a informal uh, a feedback process on the previous 2014 plan. Um, in 2018, we, we asked for feedback from our, our municipalities because we were ramping up to, to draft a new plan. And the 2019 materials management plan was drafted based on that initial feedback. We, we cut the document almost in half. It went from a, a previous 60 pages to 30 pages. Um, about 30 pages. We were trying to make it simpler, more focused on the most effective actions and easier for towns to, to um, engage with and to be, um, make for consistent services across the state. In April 2019, we had a 30-day public uh, comment period on the preliminary 2019 materials management plan and we held a hour and a half presentation and meeting and question answer period for our solid waste districts, alliances, and independent towns on April 18th. Um, that was before the ICAR process. Um, after ICAR, we've held a 57-day public comment period from about May 22nd through July 17th. Held two public meetings, one in Montpelier, one in St. Johnsbury, um, and received comments from about 16 stakeholders on the plan. I'll pause there. Senator Lyons. So in that in that process, did you hear from solid waste districts? Yes, and, primarily yes. And in terms of performance standards, were they in agreement with the performance standards that you have? It looks like a ten percent decrease in annual material generation, and that is only between that's twenty nineteen and twenty twenty four. But the baseline you're beginning with is twenty nineteen, because we've already had reduction from twenty fourteen for those first five years. So how, what standards are you, how are you measuring that, I guess? What, how are you gonna determine that? Who's responsible for that? And is that gonna become uh, what? Uh, who's responsible for that is, um, that's a goal that the agency set um, for, for the state through this plan. Mm -hmm. And it's, it starts in 2019 because the plan is a five year plan. So the baseline is going to be our 2018 um, data of, of where solid waste has gone in 20, what was disposed of, what was recycled, what was composted, that sort of data. Um, How do we know where we were? I mean, I'm trying to sort out, because we started in 2014, we've made significant progress mm -hmm. across the state, mm -hmm. and now we're starting out in 2019. Uh, is this de novo? I'm trying to figure out. I guess each five-year plan sets a goal. Gotta be brand new. And starts with where waste is at at the beginning of that five-year period. And so our data, we collect data um, uh, from our transfer stations, our landfills, our recycling centers. They all have to report to us annually, um, actually some quarterly, where their materials are going. So, but do we know that we're, re we're, we're recycling and um, eliminating waste more because it's greater because we have greater waste or it's greater because we're reducing what's coming in as waste. It kind of gets to be a silly yeah. little question, but it is a very important question if you think about the types of 
materials we're discussing, mm -hmm. you know, so plastics for one, but right. also the hazardous materials. Right, right. So the, the, the goal you're referring to, the 10% reduction goal, is based on generation. So if you take the amount of trash we throw away and the amount we recycle and compost, and you add those together, that's all that we've produced of materials we didn't want anymore. We didn't want our milk chips anymore. That's generation. That's, so that goal is trying to get at um, the hope that we will actually not generate as much waste in general. I mean, recycling is good, but you really, if you don't produce the waste in the first place, that's the best. So will the agency be re making recommendations about how not to have so much waste? I mean, will there, will there be a discussion of uh, manufacturer responsibility? I think really this plan is that type of recommendation. The actions set out in this plan um, are the place where the agency sets its targets for achieving that 10% reduction. It's a start. I mean, it's, it's a start. Really a, I think we, we put a, we actually had feedback on that point from some of the districts that said, you know, how are we going to meet these goals? There's not a lot of explanation of that. So we acknowledge that the plan alone can't do it all. No, it's hard to figure out how many consumer products are being purchased, and then from that bulk, how much right. of it's being right. done with in one way or another. The best data we have is what's disposed. Um, actually, the, the most accurate data we have is, is on what is, is getting disposed, and yeah. that's our best measure of how we're doing. Our recycling data is a little bit, little bit weaker. If, mm -hmm. if Walmart bails their cardboard and sends it directly to market, we don't have that data, for example. We don't know that that happens. We have a way of estimating that because we have a study that's been done to help us get an estimate, but it's always an estimate. Do stewardship programs count as waste generation? Paint, batteries, things like that? Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a short brief section in here on um, product stewardship programs and extended producer responsibility. Um, it's, not a, it's not an area that the previous statute required us to sort of wrestle with. Um, but we, we feel like Vermont's product stewardship programs are working very well. And that data gets tracked as part of uh, the material that is recycled or safely managed. In the case of batteries, if you recycle your batteries, they, they get recycled. We can talk about it. Um, <coughs> Senator Brick. Um, by way of um, reassurance, maybe to Senator Lyons, who's going to miss this remark. <laughs> um, Senator Lyons. She's in a room where the comment is direct to me. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the, uh, when we passed 113, the Plastics Bill established a, a working group right. this summer and fall. And DC has been an active participant <coughs> in pushing in the direction you, you were mentioning. For instance, extended producer responsibility. And so I think in concert with this plan, I think there, it seems like there's a very genuine, broadly shared sense of wanting to um, do more work in the coming session. Let's hope. Good work. <laughs> Some of your specific proposals, like uh, reducing the number of required household hazardous waste pickups, um, do you anticipate any reduction in, in participation? If there are two opportunities. It's a great question. Um, so with Vermont, the way Vermont's set up with our solid waste districts and our independent towns, there's no allowance for towns to, to do um, really solid waste services by themselves. And we have had a struggle with how to set a baseline standard that can apply to somebody as large as a, salt, a countywide district versus a small town. Um, it's tough to write language that can make it effective for both. Um, our previous plan, put a high priority on household houses waste convenience collection and ramped up to the very fifth year for collection events, which, which is a pretty high bar for a town to meet. During that time, a contractor went out of business that provided these services fairly affordably, and so prices just started to climb. In addition, the contractors that provide these services didn't really want to do weekend events. They don't want to run their trucks on the weekend. They want to go during the week and make, you know, um, sort of trunk and feeder go to a facility and pick up rather than set up an entire event. So the costs were growing and people were actually competing, Vermont towns and districts were competing for these limited resources of contractors. So looking at that and um, looking at where we want to sort of go, which is um, we're, we're hopeful for more 
established uh, facilities that can that can provide actually more convenience than that as these one day events can provide. But for a town that's one town to have two events in your town per year seasonally, um, like spring and fall, we felt like that's a convenient standard that everyone can meet and can be effective for their populations. Uh, many of these independent towns are fairly rural, very small populations. Um, that's a pretty good level of service compared to, you compare it to a very large district, um, you know, a county-wide district that may offer a collection now, even less frequently per each of those towns. You know, you, you're still, but this one is getting two in that individual town. So that's the struggle. I feel like we've struck a good balance. Um, it's, and it's typical that in any district, a household hazardous waste pickup in one town is open to all members. In yes, the typically it is. Yes. Um, we still have in the household hazardous waste collection requirements that if you don't have a permanent facility, um, where you collect more than just once, once one day in the seasonal period. Um, if you don't have that, you have to hold two events, and you may have to hold more events because you have a large district. Um, so that every town has one event within 20 miles each year, if that makes sense. So if you're the Brattleboro region and your Wyndham Solid Waste District, which is roughly the boundaries of Wyndham County, um, you have some very rural towns. Uh, further from Brattleboro where they um, offer two events per year they have to offer additional events if they don't have a permanent facility but we also softened the requirements so that if somebody does sign a permanent facility um, you don't have to have those rover events the reason being you're going to increase the amount of access you have because permanent facilities are open weekly instead of just one day where you miss that day and you're like shoot I missed it it's all in the garage still I got you know that, that's where we've been going to balance and try and encourage more services but less uh, cost, cost of the event. Okay. <clears throat> Off topic but on point, as the recycling guy in my household, I'm a little concerned that I am now prevented from bringing black plastic and the tops of bottles to my recycling center. Is that something that is unique to my recycling center, or is this a statewide situation? What What's going on? Statewide, in 2012, the state um, put forth the universal recycling law, which was has the purpose of at least having a minimum level of banned recyclable materials, like requiring recycling of certain state-mandated materials. Black plastic is not one of those, neither is bottle caps. Um, so some places do accept those materials. Um, I, as far as black plastic, I'm not familiar with anybody in the state who's really recycling and able to recycle those. Anybody in the country? It's, and, <clears throat> and nationwide, they are a problem for recyclers uh, across the country. There's a very limited market for that plastic. It's, it, it can't be turned into something else of a different color. It's black. It also, when it runs on a black conveyor belt, they have. It looks like the black conveyor belt, if they use machines, which more and more facilities are using machines, they can't see it, because they, they, it looks like the conveyor belt. Um, but mainly it's the low value of those things. There are some in the Williston Murph, the Williston Material Recovery Facilities where a lot of recyclables go. The other one is the Rutland uh, Material Recovery Facilities. If you drink a bottle of water and put the cap back on, um, after you're done, it's empty, they will take that cap. Um, but the caps also tend to pop off and fall through. They can be contaminated, so. It's the, the caps cannot go through the, I mean, they, they can't be picked up because of the size. Because of the size, exactly. Well, we were told that they didn't want the caps because the machine couldn't crush them. Well, they, you're in the Northeast Kingdom, right? No. Yeah. No. How'd you guess They'll that? explode. They're, they're, they're the only, I think, district that does not want caps. Yeah, they do their own bailing there, and they keep their cost pretty pretty effective by bailing their own materials. Um, but yeah, I could see that that if if there's all that air in there and they put it through the baler, that all the tops can go flying off, which which happens at these bigger facilities too. But they have much much more robust equipment. Well, I just have to assume that that's all now ending up in the Coventry landfill. And the bottle caps are all recycled. Whatever they're not accepting. Is causing that facility to grow um, 
I don't know by how much, but obviously some of us in the kingdom are a little bit concerned about whether or not that facility um, should be growing with the watershed of Lake Mount from Agog sitting right on top of it. It might just be my personal beef, but it seems like there's got to be some way out of that problem. Reduce. Well, and actually, to, to Senator Bray's comment, the, the single-use products working group is much broader than just single-use products looking at packaging in a broader sense um, and the recycling challenges we have, including black plastic. Um, if, if it was a white plastic that they ha happen to offer you, that's recyclable and, and is statewide. Um, if it's not a number one or two, it's not banned by state law. Um, so. There are some places, because the markets are so challenged for recyclables, where they're disposing of those, and they can legally. Um, again, the state set a baseline um, of what was required to be recycled, and I actually think it was a pretty reasonable baseline at the time, and it has done well, given where the markets have recently gone. Um, looking longer term, there's a lot of investment needed in recycling in terms of more domestic capacity, and there's some changes happening, but it's Awesome discussion. Um, a, a, a couple questions. Um, one was in your summary document, which is very user friendly. Uh, it says language was removed that required swimming to prioritize working with businesses that are not recycling or composting. Um, is that just because everyone knows there is such a law already, or why, why did we throttle back on that outreach? That was just and to make the language more clear, it was to let the solid waste management districts know that they could, um, they, they needed to work with all businesses first to find out whether or not they're recycling, and then they target those companies that aren't recycling first. The way we had it worded, it made it kind of confusing. It made it sound like they had to target businesses that weren't recycling, but how would they know that they weren't recycling yeah. if they hadn't done the outreach first? We're, okay. we're constantly in a situation just, where the solid waste districts and towns are not required by state law to police the state's laws. They're, they are required to do outreach and encourage recycling. But they, they say to us, well, we don't know which business is doing the right thing. So we just took that out and instead said, prioritize whoever you haven't been to, just to make it more straightforward for them, essentially. Um, I'm, and then I'm going ahead uh, in the plan itself, uh, page 13, um, under biosolids, sludge septic residuals. Um, in the final paragraph on that page, it talks about sludge uh, and demonstration of meeting standards for contaminants, metals, and by uh, polychlorinated biphenyls established by the rules. Do we not have any rules that are applicable to sludge related to chemicals other than polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. I mean, for instance, PFOA. So we're struggling with um, groundwater standard, mm -hmm. a surface water standard, uh, drinking water standards. Yep. Do we not have anything related to sludge? Um, it's an excellent question. Um, I just talked to Eamon Tuig in the residuals program before coming here. I said, Eamon, we're, we're bringing the MMP forward and there's there's requirements in there. He helped me write this section um, specifically. So he's gonna be much more familiar with what's in their rules uh, regarding residuals and the standards for, if there's standards in there for PFOA. Um, the solid waste rules are being, are in draft, um, which I think does include residuals in there as well. So that's, that's a place where we can address that. Well, I was just comparing that to the you know, 10 BSA 6604C, mm -hmm. where it goes into that, and it talks about running pilots, for instance, and I don't know if, uh, although those are allowed on page 14, uh, pilots can be authorized on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't know if the state is actively involved in piloting uh, alternate solutions. Um, I mean, for members of the committee, like, one of the um, challenges is that PFOA, for instance, is broadly distributed in the environment. Then we gather it all together and concentrate it at a landfill, and then we get leachate that further concentrates it. So there's there's one process that's perversely concentrating stuff. And wastewater treatment facilities with sludge seems like it's potentially the same kind of unintended consequence of concentrating something we're trying to avoid. And I don't know. It, 
this talks about doing it. I don't know if we, if the department's actively working on trying to address that that vector. Mm -hmm. Here's what I know of the the PFAS um, work and sort of pilots to date. Um, the the landfill um, in Coventry, there there there's a contractor that our our solid waste program has hired to look at uh, the leachate um, and. Also, there's discussion of, of pretreatment before it goes to the wastewater treatment facility. Um, my, my thinking is that the solid waste rules themselves, when, which we're working on as well, um, to eventually come to this committee, um, are the place where um, that can be further addressed <laughs> uh, in addition to the residual section for wastewater. And I think your permit uh, for Coventry required That's my understanding. an investigation yes. of handling. Yep. Uh, looking at uh, Kathy Jamison's letter, the same or the same section that Senator Bray amended, um, uh, language was added to allow under performance standards uh, to allow uh, SWMEs to conduct business outreach either by phone or in person, instead of requiring it all in person. But the economic impact statement on page two says the 2019 plan proposes to require SWMEs to conduct business outreach in person rather than by mail, email, or phone. Along this may increase staff costs. So, which is it? Is your question? Yes. Um, it is by phone and in person is is allowed. So it, this is incorrect. The uh, the economic impact study. I should have fixed that. It was holding from the ICAR version. Okay. When we had that in there and we got feedback on it, they wanted to be able to do it by phone, we said, that sounds good. And, and we'll that. Um, and similarly, there's a mention of the economic impact survey of a one survey being required. We've struck an entire survey requirement, mainly due to feedback that, you know, a statewide survey will be much more effective. And we, we've been talking with them about this for five years. It's time that we sort of just put it on the state. Uh, my other question, I will hold it. It's more of a long conversation about organic waste, food scraps, digesters, closing Randolph, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, so sure. It's not a question. <laughs> yes, Senator Brett. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would move that uh, we approve Rule uh, 19 P44. Any other questions or comments? If not, all those in favor, please start by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. And we have approved 19P44. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, is this the last item? It is. Um, just wanted to ask Betsy to give us a very short update on rabies and health officers and um, how they are, the system that deals with um, confining dogs and doing rabies stuff. Um, Senator Lyons and I have a bill that would go to the uh, health care committee to direct the Department of Health to write rules on how they conduct their business, and the alternative would be that this committee would ask the health department to do that. And, and um, our council has done a little research. Does this not have anything to do with swine on the lamb? No, it has to do with the dog bites. Swine <laughs> on the lamb. Those, uh, you know, the, the wild, the, new, the newly feral pigs of, oh. uh, of Orange County. Oh, oh that, that's the town of Orange. It's, it, it's a, uh, Senator Benny would be an expert on that. He was an expert on that particular farmer. <laughs> it's a part of the Caledonia Orange. So you can see uh, this was referenced in the last agenda item from your minutes from the last meeting. Um, at the last meeting, Senator McDonald requested that LCAR review whether LCAR should request the Department of Health to initiate rulemaking regarding its guidelines for local health officers. LCAR has the authority 
to require an agency to initiate rulemaking. It's set forth in the Administrative Procedure Act in 3DSA 831C. That subsection provides that an agency shall initiate rulemaking to adopt as a rule an existing practice or procedure when requested <coughs> by LCAR. So in that um, permission, a practice is a substantive or procedural requirement of an agency that affects people outside of the agency. So a practice is something that requires someone outside the agency to do something. And a procedure is a practice that's been adopted in writing. So the question is whether the Department of Health's guidelines for its local health officers really do, do constitute um, a practice or a procedure. They're in writing, so they would potentially be a procedure, um, but as I understand it from working with my colleague, Katie McLynn, who has been um, in discussions with Senator McGillan's commission talking with the Department of Health, it's my understanding that the Department of Health does not consider its handbook that it puts out to be a procedure because it doesn't, as I understand the Department of Health's position, is that this handbook is not a requirement upon local health officers, but rather it's a guidance document that's just giving information about how the Department of Health interprets the laws, and it doesn't contain requirements on local health officers themselves. So I was discussing with Senator McDonald before the meeting that perhaps if you want to pursue this issue of whether to require DOH to initiate rulemaking to adopt those that handbook as a rule that perhaps LCAR would want to hear from the Department of Health about what's in the handbook, whether it does actually contain requirements on health officers and what they have to do in doing their job, or whether it really is just more informational um, without requirements. If it is just informational without requirements on local health officers, it doesn't seem that it would rise to the level of being a procedure, and therefore LCAR wouldn't have the authority to require them to initiate rulemaking to adopt it as a rule. So I, I take one minute to say what the issue is. The rabies uh, health officers deals with rabies, dog bites kid. Um, health officer in the booklet of instructions and procedures has the, uh, the authority to um, impound that dog for 10 days to see whether or not it has rabies. And in the particular case, the dog was neither registered nor did it have a rabies shot, and then the dog was taken to a kennel where it was put in the kennel. And the, someone from the town office is called up and said, release the dog. So the kennel released the dog. And um, the health officer had his ticket pulled. Um, and all of these things are, they want to be written down as to what is expected. If you put a dog in for 10 days of observation because it doesn't have a shot, etc., then there ought to be an understandable procedure for who releases the dog from the kennel, or how do you check one in, or in this case, the neighbor said the dog ran loose, um, the house didn't have a pen, um, the dog bit the, the child in the house, and the health officer sent the dog to a kennel. And then it, two days later, it was released through um, some procedure that is unknown and, and, and um, amorphous. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Maybe just sending a bill to the health committee to work on would be one solution. The other one would be for the health department to take it upon itself to, to put into rule or propose rules so that the various parties would know what their responsibilities were and, and they wouldn't be, after the fact, pointing fingers at one another and, worrying about it. So I would hope that we would, I, I want to talk to the health department and then the next meeting, bring the subject up again and ask for your advice and counsel and take the route that the committee would suggest to me. Senator Craig. Um, Senator McDonald, when you said it, uh, the, the health officer had his ticket pulled, well, I, I'm not quite sure I understand what that means. The, the um, he, he was told he was, um, no longer qualified to be a health officer to see that in town as a dog. Uh -huh. So he sort of like let go by the town as professor? Uh, there was a call from um, the, either the, the town manager or the select board to say, release the dog. And so 
why have a book saying that you you have the authority to impound a dog that is is worrisome because it doesn't have a registration and okay. hasn't had a rabies shot and they get kept it and you don't have a place to keep it. So there ought to be people should all be working out of the same playbook, which I think is what they call rules. So the, the Department of Health can also undertake that at their own initiative, right? Yep. They, they could, well, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know what their statutory authority well, they, is for adopting it. But. They may get into a separation of powers issue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But, but they can but, promulgate policies. We don't we usually get that own. far in Vermont. We usually try to resolve it. So, and LCAR does have the authority to request they consider creation of yes. yes, you can request that they do that. And I, I, one of the things I wanted to note, in this authority um, for LCAR um, to require an agency to initiate rulemaking to adopt as a rule or practice or procedure, it is only, interestingly, only initiate rulemaking. You can't require them to adopt it as a rule. You can just say you have to start the process um, to adopt as a rule, a practice or a procedure, um, but you, by statute, can't require them to fully go through and adopt the rule finally. So theoretically, we're talking about asking them to do something that they never, never have to actually finish as it, correct, it's a simple point. A lot of them it might be fun to drag them in and just yeah. see how it all flushes out. I mean, if it's a legitimate concern, it would be a whole lot speedier than trying to put a bill through the legislature in the way of that. But, uh, so, I have a question for council. So, when um, I know sometimes there are written documents from agencies or departments that provide information, like mm -hmm. how to interpret something in mm -hmm. or whatever, but it doesn't determine somebody's action. Doesn't state a requirement. That's so correct. this seems somehow materially different. Like you can impound a dog for 10 days. So that's like authorizing an action. How is that not somehow? I don't quite understand how something in print that says that doesn't have force of law behind it. So yeah, that, and th this goes to the heart of the question: whether it is actually procedure, meaning it is a requirement on local health officers or whether instead, under the APA, it's more of a guidance document, which is defined as something in writing that assists the public by providing the agency's current interpretation of the law. Um, so that's the question of whether it's just DOH interpreting what the law says that a health officer can do, here's what the law says that you can do, or whether, it, and that would be a guidance document, or whether instead it's procedure saying, DOH is saying, Local health officers, you must do this. Mm -hmm. This is a requirement that we are putting upon you. In this case, it's in a binder and it says you know, if a dog's been a person, quarantined for 10 days, if an Indian health officer, there's no uh, way to hold it responsibly. Or, and, and then once it gets there, what's the, how long, you know, how do you let it out? Or can I, it, it get signed for? Or, when the day day's over, is there a, a does it get signed? The dog gets signed out, or is it just just um, like and jump in and did react to phone calls? So, yeah, that's it, a political it just, process. Yep. Does, does the town the Sorry, does, does the town pay for that kenneling? No, no, it's at the uh, expense of the owner in the three ring wine. Or the guidance that the fellow had put into a three ring park from the health department guidelines and directions. So, so are you? health office. So you're going to talk to the department of health? Yep. And I got stuff called yeah. David Engel there in the morning. And then let you know. I have a question on a different matter for down to this one. I think we're finished. Well, let me ask yep. Sarah Don, should we wait to hear from you to see whether to add it to the agenda for next meeting? Put an update on there just so okay. get an update and that'll be, be fine. Sounds good.
Because I'll send it to and I have to put in a bill to, yeah, to direct them to, to do that by statute. The health officer should have, there should be the authority, the appeal, whatever sort of things that go to statute. So uh, I was traveling and I missed our last health car meeting, um, which is, and I don't see anything in the minutes to tell me whether it happened or not, but in the prior meeting, uh, on two rules, we were going to send a letter to the committee of jurisdiction. That was on the energy um, services work. I don't know if those letters came through, Elkar approved them, and they go off. Go off. So that was on the RVs and CVs, yeah. and just to remind, Elkar objected only on the basis of the copyright issue. The rule, as initially filed with Elkar, purported to allow a private entity to hold a copyright over the rule which was an issue that you repeatedly, or that you have for the third time now, objected to. Since that time, DPS, Department of Public Service, has indicated that it would revise the rules to eliminate that copyright issue. Um, and Department of Public Service has submitted a revision to at least the Arby's to eliminate that copyright issue. And in those draft memos to committees of jurisdiction, it was essentially in draft form because the draft memo still um, was holding out there the question of whether an LCAR was going to move forward and certify its objections to the rule. So at this point, the memos have not been sent out because you haven't. We did discuss the last meeting that you'll wait to um, review the revised proposed revisions um, that DPS is going to submit. And then you can, after you determine whether to certify your objection, then we can revise the memo accordingly, um, eliminate any reference to an objection if you choose not to move forward with an objection. So the memos haven't gone out yet. Okay, thanks. Um, right, and as you okay. kindly noted in the minutes, it also included reviewing miscellaneous issues related to implementation and enforcement. I think enforcement was the thorniest of the things. Having, having regulations that were enforced was Concern. And those two, so we, I can give you another copy of those draft memos um, that does address the enforcement concerns that were raised when you first considered RVs and CVs. Um, so I can just give you another copy of that memo as it stands right now. Great, thank you. And Charlene reminded that um, DPS did submit the, its revised version of the RVs. I don't pack it. Great, it's in your packet, so that will be discussed at the next meeting. I think they're waiting to see what you do with RVs before it moves forward with attempting to revise the CDs, which I perceive is going to be a heavier lift for them to revise the rule to address the copyright issue. Thank you. Senator Bennett moved to adjourn. Those in favor? Aye. 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 There's no opposition. Aye.